from what most are uh, used to seeing when they come here to a council meeting. So even though this really is a council meeting, it's uh, more of a workshop. So um, we're still going to call the meeting to order so that all council members are present with the exception of uh, Council Member Koval, who is uh, not able to make it with us today. And um, uh, we have on the agenda public comment. And we'll take some public comment up front. Um, however, as we go through this um, exercise today, if anyone from the audience has an idea or a thought about what's being said, submit a uh, speaker slip and we'll take some more comment uh, towards the end or wherever we need to because um, we want to make sure that everybody's heard and if there's uh, good ideas, we want to hear the good ideas also. Uh, so does the council uh, think that's a good idea? Or? All right. <laughs> All right, we'll uh, we'll make that uh, happen then. And so uh, let's go ahead and uh, begin the uh, revenue workshop. And uh, who's speaking first? We have one public speaker, Janet Garvin. All right, Actually, thank you, Janet. Come on up. I would like to reserve my comment to the end. Okay, I, that's fine. She's going to speak a little bit later. And uh, you know what? Even though um, it's a little bit less formal today, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and have everyone that wants to speak come up to the uh, lectern and use the microphone. That way, everything gets on the record and is heard. And when we, if we have to, we can review the um, uh, tape recording later on to make sure that I, everything is recorded properly and um, don't miss anything. Okay. Your turn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Is this thing on? Yes, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Somebody yeah. awake? You can all wave, it's okay, just check in. This is a workshop, folks. It's not formal, formal, but we do want to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Yeah, please turn off your cell phones, please. Okay, better? There we go. Um, so ladies and gentlemen of the council, as well as those here in the room, uh, at the city council's workshop this past March, the council did determine that they wanted to have a workshop to look at the fiscal stability of the city, both short and long term. Uh, it's, a, it's a positive step for the city, just as any other community. You may have read a number of articles that various cities throughout San Diego County are doing the same thing right now. Uh, currently, you'll see the presentation. The city is fiscally solid right at this point in time, um, and we should be for a couple of years going down into the future. Um, beyond that, nobody knows in a crystal ball what the world will bring. But we want to plan ahead. We want to make positive decisions that put the city in the best light possible. And uh, this is an opportunity for the city council to hear information about our revenue streams, um, options for increasing, modifying, changing those if necessary, and to provide some alternatives for the staff to start working on going forward into the future to make sure that we all stay in a positive mode. Um, and to that end, uh, our finance director and finance manager have prepared a great presentation that I think is very informative for both the council and the community. And I'm going to turn it over to Tim McDermott. Thank you, Marlene. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Minto, council members, community members, city staff. Um, on the screen before you is the agenda for our conversation today. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, providing the financial status update. It's been seven months since we adopted the current fiscal year budget, so we're past due for a discussion about how things look here fiscally. Uh, after that, we'll talk about some public facility needs, uh, provide a brief history on some of the actions the city has taken over the past couple of decades to, to keep things uh, positive fiscally. Uh, we'll talk about a variety of options for enhancing revenues, those that the city has more direct control over, those that would require voter approval. Uh, we're kind of throwing a lot of things out there. Some of them probably don't make sense, but uh, there are things that are out there in the world of municipal finance that other public agencies utilize to help fund their operations and infrastructure needs. We've, we've included some things in here. Um, can, can I interrupt just a second? Yes. Um, as you go through this, if there's some kind of acronym or jargon, you make sure everybody understands what that is. Absolutely. Thank you. Try to keep it uh, not technical, but uh, before it's possible. And of course, we're looking for the council's input throughout the presentation. As you mentioned, this is a workshop, so we're looking for a dialogue, we're looking to hear from you every step of the way. 
And uh, by the end of the afternoon, uh, hopefully we have an idea of what next steps or future steps uh, steps should be taking. So looking at the year that was, fiscal year 18-19, got some very good news regarding last fiscal year. So we ended last fiscal year with a reserve, an available reserve balance of $11.7 million. It's actually a $1.8 million improvement over where we expected to end the year when the budget was developed in spring of 2019. The primary reasons for that uh, additional bottom line, if you will, sales tax revenues were definitely stronger than expected. Um, county pool allocations, online sales, out-of-state sales that, have, that come through the county pool were definitely stronger than expected. In addition, one of our principal sales tax generators in particular has performed extremely well over the past couple of years and has uh, provided some, some strong revenues for the city. Our planning and engineering revenues from land development activities were stronger than expected. Uh, really across, across the board, the revenues, virtually all revenue items were um, they came in as expected or slightly better than projected. In addition, last fiscal year, we did have quite a bit of expenditure savings. There were a handful of vacant positions in the organization that are currently being filled. Uh, that contributed to some expenditure savings. Uh, in particular, the fire department had some non-personnel cost savings. Our community services department had some personnel cost and some, some operational cost savings that contributed, all of the above contributed to the $1.8 million in additional resources available coming out of last fiscal year. And the good news is, as much of that does continue to impact us as we go forward into the current fiscal year. So looking at the current fiscal year, we're seeing continued strength in sales tax. Um, at this point, due to the delay in information through the state to the local jurisdictions, we only have one full quarter's worth of data, but it's a strong quarter. Um, I actually hope to get the reports. I got the reports on Friday of last week. Uh, but we're going out to the council here. Um, I'll get them get out this evening before so you have them here this week. Um, sales tax revenues are continuing to be strong, again, in the building and construction category and the county pool allocations. Uh, one of the positive outcomes of, of what we're starting to see is additional revenue come through from out-of-state online retail sales. Uh, it's, a, it's an impact of the, the Wayfair court decision. Um, those revenues are starting to actually uh, be realized. Uh, property taxes were stronger than expected. When we developed the budget, we anticipated about a 6.5% increase in assessed valuation here in Santee in, in, in the current fiscal year. The good news is that actually it's 7.7% of an increase, again adding to the, the city's revenues from the current year. This is the third year in a row that Santee has been in the top five in the county of all cities as far as the growth in assessed valuation from one year to the next. Um, the, the function of, as you can see around the community, what's going on with, with uh, residential and some other developments. Of course, it's a reflection of the overall strong economic conditions, low unemployment, good wage growth, overall economic conditions are solid right now. Okay, so what you're seeing now is a five-year look down the road. Uh, what this does is it looks at, it starts with the adopted budget, makes some adjustments for the things that we actually know at this point in time, makes some protections going forward for the rest of the fiscal year. Just want to point out that uh, we'll be bringing the actual mid-year budget adjustments for the current fiscal year to the city council in about a month. Uh, so the numbers when we bring that forward may not exactly align with this. This is our best look at this point in time. Uh, but what I'd like to point out, starting with the first column on the left for the current fiscal year, that are re the revised column there. If you go about halfway down the screen, you're gonna see a number of revenues over under expenditures and transfers out. That number reflects a negative. So I wanna remind the council that when we adopted the budget, we had a planned use of supplemental reserves in excess of $800,000. So when we filled the budget, that number would have been in excess of $800,000 using reserves that had already been there, supplemental reserves. The number is now, now negative 120, which is a reflection of the additional revenues that we're looking at in the current, current fiscal year. Um, at the end of the current fiscal year, we're looking at a reserve balance of about 26% of general fund expenditures, which is about 6% 6 greater than the reserve policy level of 20%. percent we will be about $2.6 million in additional reserves beyond the base reserve level. 
uh, we'll, we'll engage you in a, in a more thorough discussion on those reserves with them into your budget and have some suggestions on, uh, on what to do with those reserves or how to structure those reserves. Going forward, um, let me point out the, the first two lines, the revenues and the operating expenditure lines. You notice the percentage change going forward. Next year, we're looking at operating expenditures, anticipated outgrowth of growth in revenues, continuing each year as we go down into the future. Next year still does look good, though. If you look at the, the second column, the FY2021 projected, uh, we're looking at operating revenues over expenses of about $1.3 million. Once we fund the transfers and other uses, and let me briefly mention what's included in that number. Uh, that includes transfers into the capital improvement program based on the adopted five-year capital improvement program that the council adopted back in June of 2019. That's primarily what makes up that amount. In addition, it includes transfers to the vehicle replacement fund for the ongoing replacement of city vehicles and it includes $250,000 on an annual basis in payments towards the city's unfunded retirement health obligation. So the good news for next year, revenues over under expenditures and transfers out, we're looking at a surplus next year. Here again, these are preliminary numbers. We haven't even started the budget development process for next fiscal year, but at this point in time, things are converging for next fiscal year. Going beyond the upcoming fiscal year, uh, things look to turn with the growth in expenditures, as I mentioned, occurring with the growth in revenues. In order to fully fund the general fund expenditures that were identified in the capital improvement program, up to the, you know, the, the adopted capital improvement program, uh, it's about $1.5 million, $1 million in available resources to fund that. We'd be looking at a shortfall of about $457,000. Um, that would be funded at this point in time from supplemental reserves. As you notice on the bottom line, the reserves stay above the 20% reserve policy and, until we get out to fiscal year 2024, assuming there's no other planned use of those reserves. Any questions? All right, so next what I want to, well, let me, let me back step here. So this is labeled the status quo scenario, a couple of the basic assumptions that are built into here based on life as we know it today, life looking down five years, known or expected impacts on the operating side of the budget. Regarding key revenues, it assumes property tax growth continues in the range of four to six percent. Um, historically, other than during the recession, almost essentially every year property tax growth exceeds four percent. Uh, the past three years we've seen six to eight percent growth in property tax revenues, so we're projecting four to six in the next the three out years of the projection. Sales tax revenues have been projected out at 2.5% annual growth each year going forward. How much? Sorry. Two point two and a half. <coughs> All right, so I've prepared just an alternative scenario. I'm calling it a recession scenario. Uh, what this is intended to represent, it's not intended to be the crystal ball. This is what exactly what we're expecting. What it is intended to do is acknowledge the fact that we are 10 years into an economic cycle without a recession. It's been more than 10 years since the end of the Great Recession. Typical economic cycles are five to seven years in length. Typically, by five to seven year point, you can expect some type of an economic slowdown or even a recession. So what I wanted to present is what the impact would be, and this is a, what I'm going to call a mild recession. And the scenario that is on the screen right now, in FY21-22, sales tax revenues drop by 2%, property tax revenues go flat, they stay down there for another year before the recovery starts. As a point of reference, going back to the Great Recession from 08-09, sales tax revenues declined by 13% during that recession, and property taxes dropped by almost 9%. So comparatively, this is an extremely mild scenario. And we hopefully don't experience anything like that in any of our lifetime. You see that happen? Not that. Something mild or something extreme? Something like this is entirely possible. Mm -hmm. Five-year horizon, absolutely. So what I do want to point out is just the, 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 the known differences between 
uh, the city's financial position between the status quo scenario and the recession scenario starting with that third year, the FY21-22. Focus, we can focus on the revenues over under expenditures and transfers out to be you know, right there in the middle. Whereas under the prior version in years three, four, and five, we're looking at utilizing reserves to the tune of about 457,000, 927, 945. Those numbers radically changed <coughs> 1.2 million, 2.9 million, 3.5 million. So this isn't a prediction but it's something we need to acknowledge as an actual potential. Okay, moving forward, I can briefly talk about what's not included in, that, in either of those scenarios. And that is funding certain public facility needs that have been identified here in the community by community members, by the city. Uh, the first would be fire station number four, the replacement of that 50 plus year old station. Uh, estimated to be $17.5 million in total cost. The vision is hopefully being able to collaborate with the county on a public safety center. <coughs> the amounts here represent the city's share of those costs if we're able to do so. Uh, $17.5 million project. If we were able to finance that project over a 30 year period, we'd be looking at about an annual debt service of about $1.1 million. The community center. The good news is the capital improvement program anticipates full funding for the first phase of the community center in 2021. That would be for the teen and senior component of the community center. So we're hopeful that through the collection, the continued collection of our development impact fees and through putting together some other monies, phase one, phase one is funded. Phase two, phase three is another story. Uh, the total cost for phases two and phases three, which in general would include uh, the gymnasium, the public event space, and those are the key components of phases two and three. Uh, the total cost for, for those phases is $32.3 million. If financed over a 30 year period, we're looking at a $2.1 million annual debt service. Um, the, the library is another project discussed in the community. Uh, this, is, this assumes a 20,000 square foot library. Estimated cost of $20 million, might be a little on the high side, but um, for, for discussion purposes, using that as, a, a, as the, the, the point to focus on, that would be a $1.3 million annual debt service cost if we were able to finance that over a 30 year period. In addition to these projects, the Adopted Capital Improvement Program does identify other highest priority <coughs> unfunded capital, capital improvement program needs of about $24 million. Those primarily consist of investments in the paving, the street repair and rehabilitation, the CMP, or the impact repair program, programs for projects such as that. All right, so I briefly want to talk about some of the things the city has done over the past couple of decades, couple of years. I mean, first, let me just set the table. If we go back to 1978 with the adoption of or the, uh, the, the approval by the voters of California Proposition 13, from that point in time forward, there have been a number of voter initiatives, there have been a number of uh, legislative actions at the state level, a number of court cases that have acted, that have, that have enacted changes that have all, over time, uh, made it more and more challenging for local government to control the use of rates and rates. All for good reason, all with good intent. But the, but the end result is the challenge to local governments is, is definitely there. We couple that with ongoing unfunded state mandates, the loss of development, the transfers of revenue by the state, which fortunately are pretty much done because it, there's nothing left for them to take. Um, that's that's been the dynamic over the past yeah, 20 years. Last words. <laughs> right. So you know, being faced with that scenario, that dynamic here over the you know, past couple of decades. The city's been heavily economic development focused. Just one look at the town center, Trolley Square area, and see you know, the, the transformation that's happened there, the great tax base, sales tax base, property tax base, the convenience for our residents and our citizens, of, uh, the shopping opportunities and restaurants that are there. Um, all those have helped the property tax base and sales tax base and contributed to the city being fiscally solvent. 
Uh, recent actions include the establishment of the Art Entertainment District, which is hopefully going to be a launching pad for um, a different type of energy in town center. Um, also the branding campaign with the adoption of the new city brand and the logo and the campaign that's going to follow that to get that implemented. Uh, those are all good tools going forward to help the city in, in its economic development activities. Back in 2012, the voters of CNT approved a transient occupancy tax for TOT increase. Um, our TOT rate was increased from 6% to 10%. That was done here again on the heels of the Great Recession. In addition, 2012, January 2012, January 31st is the, the death date of redevelopment in the state of California. So in 2012, we brought this measure forward because voters supported it. Our TOT revenues went from $115,000 prior to the, to, to the increase. Uh, currently, they're at about $575,000 per year. So it's a rate increase and also some expansion of the applicability of the TOT uh, that has helped enhance that revenue stream. Uh, franchise agreements, the city has been active in looking at its franchise agreements, looking for opportunities to uh, help utilize those to assist the city. The most recent such action would be in the Cox Communication and at and franchise agreements where we've now pulled the trigger on peg fees. Uh, those are going to provide about $150,000 annually in resources that will be used. What are peg fees? Public educational and governmental fees. Thank you. The intended use or the required use is for capital expenditures mm -hmm. so that meetings such as this, the city council meetings can be live streamed. We can upgrade the technology. We all struggle with these screens in here from time to time. Uh, the voting system, uh, get the cameras in place so that we can live stream and, and, and you know, effectively get uh, what happens in this room with the city council meetings to the citizens and the stakeholders of the, of the community. So that's going to relieve the general fund of having to come up with that money for those expenses. Excuse me. Uh, the city's been very active in cost recovery. Again, 2012 was kind of a benchmark year in that regard. The fee schedules in San Antonio hasn't been updated in about 20 years. Uh, at that point in time, we uh, um, brought on a cost of services consultant and brought forward to the city council the results of that study. Bottom line, we were able to enhance cost recovery uh, by about $450,000 on year on average by truly understanding the cost of the services to the, to the community that we provide and making informed decisions on what those fees should be. Tim, as you talk about that, uh, I think that there's going to be an impact to uh, people working in our community affected by that EB-5, depending on how the lawsuit comes out. Uh, the question that comes up now is, uh, all those people that now are going to be independent contractors, are they going to also have to pay our um, permit fees or business license fees? Well, and the answer to that is, well, I mean, in some cases, I mean, if they're brought on board as an employee as a result of AB5, I mean, that was the intended result of AB5 is to make sure that if people are actually employees, that they're hired as actual employees and not you know, kept in the shadows as part of the shadow, or I can't think of the term right now, the workforce, without any benefits. Those that are then um, acknowledging their role in becoming legitimate independent contractors, it'd be impacted in Santee much less than any other community. Our business license fee is, is a fee-based program. All it does is charge to businesses the cost for us to manage and implement the program. So I believe our new business license fee is $88, and that includes $4 of that goes to the state of California. Annual well, renewals of $35. What, what made that be, me think of that is because the guy who cuts my hair, there's like six people working in the barber shop, and all of them now are going to be independent contractors just renting a space and paying all their own bills, their own, um, you know, uh, Social Security, oh, everything, that, all the roll-ups that go along with being... So then each one of those persons in there, you would think, would be in, require a business license. Right, and they would. The good thing is I mentioned about CNT is a business license fee and not a business license tax, which we'll talk about later. Okay. More than half the cities in the county actually have a business license tax. So sole proprietors, such as what you described there, um, would be subject in many other most other jurisdictions in the county 
to a business license tax typically based on a percentage of gross receipts. Here, they paid just the basic fee for the property Good. program. I just hate penalizing <coughs> people because we have a road uh, assembly member who gets a lot of us. That's good. Uh, in the area of cost recovery, another thing CNT does is we, we are we look for opportunities internally. So we actually recover about $1.3 million back to the general fund from special funding sources. We make sure that the capital improvement program carries its way. The engineers, the inspection staff that work on those projects. If the project is funded with you know, uh, development impact fees or other special revenue funding sources, uh, we make sure that those projects reimburse the general fund for the staff time and the cost incurred, the actual cost incurred. Um, about $1.3 million in total recovery of the general fund on an annual basis. And shifting to the expenditure side of things, um, Santee has a long demonstrated history of managing a tight budget in the good times and the tough times. Everybody pulls back when the going gets tough and the, the economy does a downturn. Uh, the real test in my mind is what does a public agency do when the going is good and you know, the money's flowing? Um, Santee's been responsible and not gotten ahead of itself, not overextended, not overhired, not extended the organization, um, unnecessarily so. We've been responsible in that regard, so we're better able to navigate things when things go south. Um, budgets are always in balance. We have tight budgetary controls. You notice we come forward every year at the end of the year, and there's always a positive story. The money that's been saved at the end of the year. Uh, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be a given here. Other uh, actions taken by the city in the, are in the area of retirement costs, retirement health co health costs. Uh, the city, before the state required it, the city got out there and adopted a lower tier of retirement benefits for new employees, saving the city money increasing, increasingly over time. Um, retiree uh, the retirement costs as well are being shared more so with the employees, not just shared, but the employees now are paying a portion of the employer's share of the CalPERS retirement costs. All employee groups in Santee are now doing that, starting this fiscal year. We've closed all the retiree health programs. There are, one, there are just a couple of them here in Santee. They are not, not extravagant by any means. They're all closed to future entrants, other than there are four current employees that are eligible to, be, uh, to roll into one program. Um, that's it. The door is now closed behind them. The benefits have been capped. There's no future escalators. Uh, we've established a no tax trust, as I referred to earlier this, uh, in this presentation. And by doing so, uh, in less than two years, we've actually reduced our retiree health unfunded liability by half. From over $4 million down to $2 million. So, yeah. Turn over to Heather for a few minutes to talk about some of the things that the city can continue to do <coughs> that we really have more control over. Good afternoon. Next, we'll take a look at revenues that could be developed by growing the local economy. Um, revenue options, um, new business revenue options include um, annual sales tax revenue from new business um, that that would generate the following sales tax amounts. Um, a high volume family dining restaurant could potentially generate thirty to $75,000 in sales tax. Um, national supermarket chain, uh, the potential is fifty to $80,000. A department store, $135,000 to $270,000. And a new auto dealership, $200 to $250,000. Property tax would also be a component of new economic development. The city receives approximately 18 to 20 cents of each dollar of the 1% base property tax levy. A new $20 million commercial building could generate $36 to $40,000 in annual sales tax revenue. Property tax. I'm sorry, property tax revenue. More revenue options um, the city has control over are um, TOT revenues. Um, a new hotel could generate $125,000 to $275,000 annually in, in TOT revenue. And the city, as Tim mentioned, um, we continue with our methodology of cost recovery. 
uh, later, in fact, later this this year, will staff will be bringing forward a recommendation to award a contract for a cost of service user fee study. Um, it's important to note that because of the work that we did in 2012, and because of annual CPI adjustments, um, it will be less impactful than the original 2012 study. But still, it, it's good to, to, to go through the study and see if there are other options available to us. Um, and then when looking around the region, there are other non-traditional options. The county is currently um, selling naming rights, rights for some of their facilities. Uh, currently, Living Grove will be um, introducing digital billboards. Um, so, so we're always open and interested in hearing uh, new ideas. Dive into the area of taxes, just uh, provide information so we understand the nuances, the differences, what's out there, um, what's being done in the region. Um, we'll go from there. So let me start by talking about the difference, the basic difference between a general tax and a special tax. It's going to sound extremely obvious when we say it. But a general tax is any tax imposed for general governmental purposes as opposed to a special tax, which is any tax imposed for a specific stated purpose. Uh, going back to the general taxes, um, implement a new general tax that requires the majority approval, uh, approval by a majority of votes cast on the measure by the voters. Um, the general tax measure could be accompanied on the ballot, and agencies do that. With, they accompany it with an advisory measure, which in effect seeks direction from the voters on the intended use. Um, general tax measures can be initi initiated by city council action. It can also be done through voter initiative. Going to the special taxes, special taxes I mentioned, any tax imposed for a specific purpose. The revenues from a special tax can only legally be used for this very, very special purpose for which it was implemented. A special tax measure requires the approval by two-thirds of the voters, two-thirds of the votes cast on the measure by the voters. Um, parcel taxes are a typical form of special taxes, and again, they can be initiated by city council action or by voter initiative. So the, the following are some common general taxes, which um, should be noted that they can also be enacted as special taxes. Uh, the utility user tax, um, this is a tax imposed on the consumption of utility services, electricity, gas, sewer, telephone, cable television. Um, utility user taxes are commonly used throughout the state, most, most um, heavily used in the Bay Area and Los Angeles County. Um, these days there are almost no new utility taxes. We do have one city in San Diego County, Chula Vista, that does have a utility user's tax. Um, as Tim, Tim mentioned earlier, kind of just kind of started talking about the business license tax. Santee does not have a business license tax. We currently have a business license fee. Uh, as he mentioned, it's a cost that's based on cost recovery of the business license program. A business license tax would be leveled based on the percentage of gross receipts or the number of employees, type of business operation, or other factors. Uh, slightly more than half of the cities in San Diego County have a business tax. There are a handful, like Santee, that have a business fee. There is a downside to the tax in that it can affect business location and, and expansion decisions. Then um, the cannabis business tax. Uh, different types of there are different types of cannabis business entities. We've got retail, cultivation, manufacturing, and testing. In conversations with cannabis consultant professionals, and there are those things, cannabis consultant professionals. We are hearing that the production capacity exceeds the retail man demand by five to eight times. Um, these businesses are heavily taxed, and they're in a tough licensing and regulatory regula regulatory. Uh, environment. If the city did decide to consider a cannabis tax, it is estimated that Santee could support one to two retail outlets. The estimated revenue generated from one 
cannabis retail outlet would be about $140,000 a year. Uh, TOT taxes, Tim talked about that as well. In 2012, we increased our tax rate from 6% to 10%. Um, this is in line with most cities in San Diego County as well as the state of California. And our current year projections are um, expected to exceed $575,000, which he also mentioned. The final, the final uh, general tax on the slide is an add-on sales tax, which Tim will discuss um, on the next few slides. So let me start with just some sales tax basics. Um, statewide, the sales tax rate is 7.25%. Uh, of that, 1% is allocated to the local jurisdictions such as Santee. That allocation is based on the point of sale, the point where the transaction is consummated, the sale is completed. In San Diego County, the base tax rate is actually 7.75%, which includes the half cent transnet county water tax. In 2003, California law was changed to allow, Cal to allow counties and cities to seek increases in their sales tax rate. Uh, these days it is the <coughs> on the local tax measure that you see. Currently, uh, there are 217 cities across the state have actually implemented additional sales tax measures. That's uh, 45% of the cities across the state. In San Diego County, seven of the 18 San Diego County cities currently have, on, have additional sales taxes in place. We know what broke is as a ballot measure in March coming up, not included in that number, of course. So in implementing add-on sales taxes, they can be done as low as one-eighth of one percent, up to a maximum of one percent, in increments of one-eighth of one percent. There was only one city across the state that has the one-eighth of one percent sales tax. What's most commonly seen is the half cent or the full one cent add-on sales tax. Uh, to date, 74% of the general sales tax increase measures statewide have been successful with the voters. So this slide summarizes the current add-on sales taxes that are in place in San Diego County. Uh, Chula Vista has two separate measures that were implemented, half cent each. Uh, Del, Del Mar has got a full 1% additional sales tax, as does National City. Mesa has a three quarter cent additional sales tax with El Cajon, Oceanside, and Vista having a half cent sales tax in place. Many of them have uh, expiration dates. You'll notice the couple of the more, recent, more recently enacted ones, Tula Vista, Vista's measure A and Del Mar, um, elected to put no expiration date on their sales tax measure. Um, all of these were done as general tax increases. None of them were done as special tax increases. And what's not on here is the El Cajon had the original half cent sales tax for the police station and the animal control facility. Uh, that was a 10 year sunset. It actually fell off, I believe, in 2014. Any questions? All right, so point to make that the allocation basis for an add-on sales tax is different than the basic 1% local tax levy, uh, local sales tax. It's allocated on what's called a point of first use as opposed to the point of sale. So it's the place at which the goods are actually put into use. <coughs> okay, so an example. Let me give a couple of examples that cut one way or the other way. A company such as HD Supply is a local sales tax generator here in sales in Santee. Uh, they're the point of sale because their, their local facility is the point where online and telephone sales of those orders are finalized here locally. Thus it becomes the point of sale because it is the point, the point of sale. Um, if there was an add-on sales tax measure, we would realize little to nothing from what HP supply generates because what they generate is being shipped to locations from their warehouses throughout the state, San Diego and throughout the state, mainly outside of Santee. <coughs> so the reverse of that would be equipment sales, car sales, things like that. So um, new car sales. Let's, let's use that example. So Santee residents 
that currently purchase a car, if they go to Elk Run and purchase a new car, they don't pay the 8.25%, they pay the local 7 and 3 quarters percent in Santee because the, the vehicle will be registered in Santee, the point of use is Santee. If Santee was to implement an add on sales tax, let's just say it's a half cent for argument's sake or discussion purposes, let's say they go to um, El Cajon again, the El Cajon tax is 8.25, but the Santee tax would also be 8.25. They would be charged 8.25% based on the tax, that, tax that's in effect here in, in Santee. If they were to buy a car in San Diego, which currently doesn't have an add on sales tax, uh, the transaction would look at the point of registration, which would be a Santee address, and buying a car in San Diego would trigger, if you're a Santee resident, you would still pay the 8.25 uh, increased uh, the local uh, sales tax add-on. Tim, who determines what uh, products are a uh, place of use or well, so, just regular? So to, to, to hopefully maybe make it more simple, if, I mean, m the majority of your transactions are going to happen in Santee where the point of sale, you know, the far away, it, it's going to be where the sale actually happens. Where you end up with this distinction is where, really two main areas, where goods are being uh, delivered. So if you make online sales, if, so online sales is a perfect example. Um, an online sales transaction will, the seller will recognize the sales tax rate in place locally. And there's certain requirements to be required to charge and remit a higher level of tax. Um, it, goods that are delivered, equipment sales, appliances, those types of things where, say, you go to El Cajon and order something that's delivered to your home in Santee by a washer dryer from Best Buy. Um, currently, the delivery address is a Santee address. When that sale happens, they'll see the delivery address and the local sales tax here in Santee is what they are required to charge, knowing where the goods are going to be delivered. So it comes into play with um, you know, heavy equipment sales that are being delivered, that are things like that. So there are some nuances there. And the majority of the transactions are routine ongoing transactions at department stores and restaurants and your traditional retail isn't affected by the, by the distinction. But I did want to make sure to point that out so we get a clear understanding of what those differences potentially are. Good. James with Grub Hub and all that stuff. Buy a hamburger from Del Cajon and pay the tax in CNT or vice versa, right? I'd be surprised if we're geared up to make those distinctions, but I'm just pointing out the ridiculousness of it. Fair point. Uh, for, for discussion purposes, then, if CNT was to consider implementing a half cent sales tax, it's a difficult estimate to come up with. We actually we've had our sales tax consultant who specializes in this. You know, run through the details of it, exactly what our current sales tax base is, and you know where our you know our bleed is, where you know where goods are being new car sales, for example, which don't happen here locally. Um, so they've looked at the regional numbers, they've looked at our numbers, and they've estimated that a half cents add-on sales tax would generate about 5.1 million dollars annually to Santee. We kind of take a step back and look at our current total sales tax, which is annually about 14.2 million dollars based on a 1% point of sale. When you cut that in half, $7.1 million compared to what we actually realized about $5.1 million. So we can't, we can't look at our current sales tax revenues, know that it's a 1% revenue, 1% you know, local point of sale, take those numbers by half and assume that's what we would actually realize. So questions? Okay, rolling forward then. Uh, I'm going to talk about some special taxes. Um, everything we've talked about so far on the tax side of things could be implemented as a special tax. Um, commonly, you see parcel taxes as special taxes, which are non ad valorem property taxes as opposed to something like a general obligation bond that we'll talk about in a moment. Non ad valorem means it's not based on the value of the property. They're assessed based on a use of a type of property use. It's a, it's also called a fixed charge 
property assessment. Uh, CFDs, community facility districts, are a form of parcel taxes, of parcel tax. Uh, parcel taxes are more, most commonly utilized for infrastructure and certain types of public services, such as public safety, recreation programs, parks and open space maintenance, uh, flood and storm drain, uh, system maintenance and protection. So something that's familiar to, to, to most of us here then would be the fire benefit fee. Technically, it's called the Sanctuary Fire Suppression Availability Charge. Uh, this is a form of a special tax that is a parcel tax. It was approved by the voters of the Sanctuary Fire Protection District back in 1980. It's assessed at the maximum amount, $41 per residential unit, $492 per commercial or industrial building. Uh, when implemented, those were the caps that were put into place. There's no CPI escalator. Uh, the residential assessment has been at the maximum amount since 1993. The commercial <coughs> assessment has been phased in in different ways. I don't know if you recall, but we actually did a parcel audit, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, and we did a phased in implementation to ensure that this was consistently applied for commercial industrial buildings. We phased that in over a three-year period, I think, in 15, 16, and 17. Point being that all commercial industrial buildings are being assessed at the maximum $492 per building. Generates $1.1 million in annual revenue to Santee. Uh, but the point to make with that is that the only growth in that revenue source is the growth in new development, new residential units, new commercial industrial buildings. Otherwise, it stays static at the current level. Yeah. Looking at general obligation bonds, we talked about public facilities. General obligation bonds are a mechanism that can be used for the acquisition or improvement of real property. Uh, cannot be used, the proceeds from a general obligation bond cannot be used for the maintenance or operation of those facilities. They are repaid for an increase in the ad valorem property taxes assessed to all property owners. So it's an additional layer onto the property tax rate, if you will, instead of the 1% base property tax levy. And we all look at our property tax bills, the school districts, um, have implemented a, a number of uh, local special taxes that are on the tax bill as part of the additional tax rates that are assessed on the value of the property. That's what a, the, to repay a general obligation bond, that would be the mechanism there as well. A uh, general obligation bond requires two-thirds of approval, and the historical success rate is just under 50%. All right, briefly I'm going to talk about special benefit assessments. A point of reference for the council might be our landscape maintenance districts, the San River Line District. Those are special benefit assessments that are put into place when the concept of special benefit has been identified for a group of property owners. Typically they can define a neighborhood or a geographic region. Uh, general benefits, general benefits that are provided have to be financed from other funding sources. So to implement a special benefit assessment, the revenue can only be used for those that are directly benefiting from these specific services uh, to which the assessment is put in place. I want to put that out there as one more area. Um, this has not been a 100% discussion on the world of what's out there, but uh, I think we cover a lot of territory on what's what's out there. and. Uh, at this point, I want to just open it back up to the council for, or the, through any speaker slips, uh, for continued discussion. Looking to hear from the council, get your thoughts, figure out the next question for you. How about if we go ahead and hear from the uh, public first? Throw uh, things around there. We have one speaker, Janet Carvin. I just want to reiterate that um, I mean, it's not an answer at all, but I would want to discourage um, that we look at uh, 
sprawl growth as uh, an answer to uh, 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 income source uh, because it's uh, been shown in the literature that sprawl growth while it does provide income on a short-term basis, it doesn't provide long-term, it doesn't pay for itself on, on a long-term basis. And I would hate to see us um, in a position where on a long-term basis we're in the same position that we are now trying to pay for uh, infrastructure uh, and maintenance that um, we uh, caused uh, to be there by having sprawl growth, such as the Nita Ranch. Um, I do think, uh, I like the idea of having uh, a lot of growth in the center of town, um, and I uh, see that um, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, expansion of business within the center of, of town. And uh, I do think that that um, the city could tolerate a half cent sales tax in, increase. Um, and I think that that would provide a lot of uh, income and could be tolerated very well in the city and would be a great benefit, benefit to us um, and would not require um, <coughs> sprawl growth. And that's just my opinion. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right. Council comments? Um, this year we go first to last. Um, tell you what, here, here's, here's my thought on a lot of this. I think that, um, we have a lot of stuff in the pipeline right now that's uh, coming. We have to be very, very careful about. Uh, we talked about a 26% uh, reserve funding. And um, I know there's been discussion in Sacramento about, um, you know, uh, mandating what reserve funding is. I don't know if you've heard the same thing or not. Um, I heard it could be as low as 15%. And that if any uh, municipality or county has more than 15% reserve funded, the state's going to take that money from them as a penalty. Um, so uh, nobody should be really surprised about that. So, um, so I think we need to be careful about that. Um, maybe we could look at, I'd like to be able to preserve some of that, find a way to maybe even create a, a, a dual track uh, reserving uh, for like uh, infrastructure needs, uh, capital improvements, things of that nature. Uh, the other stuff is the uh, rainy day uh, stuff. And of course that means just about anything. Uh, I, uh, I'm not particularly fond of uh, raising taxes. Uh, I think as long as uh, the other cities around us continue to raise their sales tax and we can you know, get people out there to buy cars, I think we'll probably do fairly well. <coughs> um, and, um, but I think the biggest thing for us is to continue to uh, create uh, business opportunities in Santee, whether it's manufacturing or other types of industrial, because then we can keep people working uh, in and living in Santee. I know that's a lot easier said than done. Um, unfortunately, yeah. Um, but I think that there could be some uh, some interesting prospects in the biotech industry and the uh, artificial intelligence industry, uh, whatever they call themselves nowadays, so to speak. And so um, I know that as far as retail goes, uh, I know we have a lot of retail here. We have a lot of, um, you know, restaurants, fast food restaurants. I like for us to uh, continue to look for um, other types of restaurants other than fast food. Uh, when I look at the numbers on the types of, you know, revenue that comes from uh, restaurants, uh, 
I think we could probably do a little bit better in that area. I mean, we have vacant land. We have people that want to build um, in the town center area. So, uh, you know, maybe uh, go with a full court press on that kind of thing and go bring a lot better types of, uh, of uh, businesses. And, you know, having said that, who really knows exactly what that looks like nowadays because of the way you know online sales go and things. I, I, but I think that we have a smart crew here and that we could uh, figure that out and find a way to bring those people, uh, those businesses here. So for me, uh, it's about economic development and that's what's going to help to solve some of our problems. We are going to have to unfortunately do some uh, some uh, building here in our city as far as uh, homes uh, because uh, people have to live in those homes and just build businesses and ask them to come from out of town because uh, you know then other areas are impacted also. So that's kind of my my thought on it. Well, <clears throat> So thank you very much for giving that to him. I know this is a, it's a lot of work that goes into all of this, and I, it's sincerely appreciated by all of us. Um, the concerns that I do have are, as looking even further down the line, we've had these meetings. Uh, the unfunded liabilities continue to grow, not necessarily decrease. Um, that's going into the future. That's a big part of why we're, when you see the last line, or depending upon which which model you look at, uh, that that uh, negative starts getting bigger and bigger, and it and it and it gets bigger each year exponentially beyond that. Uh, hence the reason for needing to, and I appreciate uh, the the, the pre-planning here. Um, we do have to think twenty years down the line, not necessarily just right now. And as such, looking at what types of businesses are more online proof versus big box stores that we depended upon uh, for all of, for a, a, a vast majority of our sales tax revenue. Uh, I think, you know, we, we all know the Home Depot is one of the biggest things that's carrying the city. Um, that and Costco are, I think, are the two biggest. That, that roughly, yeah, uh, and and there's reasons for that. I mean, Home Depot, it, you need to go get some wood to fix your home or whatever it to be. It's you, you can't wait for that to be delivered several days later. Uh, but who knows how that goes down <coughs> in the future? <clears throat> We've already seen companies like Walmart pull back from wanting to expand. Um, Target is doing the same thing and a lot of communities going to uh, more of a Target market um, because they're looking to online sales for the rest of the stuff that you don't, that you don't need uh, as quick. That's what the future holds for a lot of this. Uh, restaurants, I agree with the mayor as usual, that rest, real restaurants are, <laughs> are, are a need that our community is looking for, uh, not necessarily as fast food, but once again, this is also, I mean, we've discussed food trucks are, you know, becoming more and more uh, predominant because the cost of the brick and mortar everywhere is there, it, it's, it's just cost prohibitive for a small business to be able to thrive. If you're not some chain restaurant that has the ability to, to go negative for a couple of years until the clientele is built up and you can recoup your costs, it's very, very difficult for a mom and pops to open up, uh, especially when you're talking $4 a square foot because there's nothing available because we haven't built anything. And nobody wants to build anything if you don't have enough population to sustain that something. And it's, it's the chicken or the egg, we get it all the time. Um, it really is, but that is why cities do need to continue to grow. Uh, you've got to be able to manage that in a, in a proper manner. Uh, I am not all about, I don't think high density, high rise high density uh, is something that once again, 20 years down the line, 
ever tends to look really good. Um, I understand that it, there's some mandates to it from the state, and they are what they are. We've got to do what we've got to do, but the reality is that the American dream is never to has never been to own my own high-rise condo. Um, it's or apartment. It's to own a home with a little bit of a yard where you could have the kids playing outside um, with a dog or a cat, whatever the case may be. I guess chickens in today's world. <laughs> but doing those, that's, that is the reality and you, you, I think it's irresponsible to not plan for that as well because that is what the community wants and that's, um, that's where you, you see the most pride of ownership is in the single family detached world. And um, it's just, that's just, it's what it, just what it is in, in real estate. And it's not me running these, it, this is just the way real estate's worked for forever. Um, it's becoming more and more difficult to build in California. We know that. That's not going away anytime soon. Uh, the, it's becoming more cost prohibitive to build in California. I don't see that going away anytime soon. So it is going to continue to be more difficult to have housing. Um, hence the reason I think we will still see increases, even um, even in recessionary or minor recessionary eras. I still think we're going to see larger than that than a than a flat or stagnant. So I appreciate that number. I think that's that is like you said, it's very conservative, and I I I think that's probably even more conservative than it needs to be, but. The other side of that is sales tax, sales, um, sales revenues. I do see that possibly decreasing. Uh, I, all the different stats that you look at, inverted yield curves, looking at um, every time that uh, unemployment is at its absolute lowest level, the sharp jump up once it starts to fall. It's, it takes a very long time for unemployment to to get down low, but as soon as it starts going the other direction, it is a very sharp jump to people being unemployed, and it happens very, very fast. And uh, and that's so I do see people maybe 21, 22 ish uh, pulling back greatly. Uh, where I see manufacturing pulling back quite a bit, uh, as far as just packaging. Nobody's ordering boxes anymore. When people aren't ordering boxes, that means they're not shipping stuff. That means they're not selling stuff. Looking at all that, <coughs> that's your indicators for 18 months down the line of what's what's going to be happening. So I like that we're looking for other revenue sources. Uh, once again, with the mayor, I've never been uh, taxed your way into prosperity. I don't think that that works. I think uh, continuing to be proactive um, being open to new business sources that come in, to the next trends of uh, business sources that come in, providing one jobs but two uh, sales tax revenues would be great. Um, and I don't know for certain what that is. I mean, I think you and I have always, always fought against dispensaries of any kind in the city, and I still continue to do that. I and mean, it's yet if there's there's money there, and it's, it's legal. I don't who knows. Maybe by the time we're done, that's something that's going to change here in Santee as well. But these are all things that we do have to look at and look at real, real sales. Um, you had mentioned that in that vein, though, that the production is a five to one. Is that what you said? Oversupply. Five to eight. Or five to eight. Five, five to eight times. Oversupply. Correct. So is that? Production or manufacturing. There's three different entities. There's production, manufacturing, and distribution. Well, it's the cultivation and the manufacturing. Okay, so in both of those, both of those so the only the only side that you're seeing that there is any growth potential that's being seen is in the retail sale itself. Correct. And there's even some challenges there. Some people are pulling out of the California market, the high level of taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're having a hook up. Bring on. There you go. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So let me get my thought back. 
Um, we're talking about the high tax level, state excise taxes of 15%, local excise taxes range from 4 to 8%, and you're talking about almost a 25% tax on top of it. The, the talk or the, the, the chatter is that the illegal market, people are relying on the illegal market because they can get it cheaper. So there, there's some challenges even with the dispenser side of things. However, that is the one area where you've got the pent-up demand. The production's in place, so there is an opportunity on the retail endpoint distribution. There is an opportunity there. And that's, and that's the problem. Five, most three years from now, who knows how that's going to Of course. <laughs> Who, who would have thought that uh, by having those high taxes on them would drive up the market for illegal uh, product, I mean, sales? Um, everybody. <laughs> everybody that looks at economics in any, in any form or fashion. Uh, all right, so anyways, I, I'd love that if we do, as the mayor was stating, if there is some sort of um, push from the state of California to yet again look for ways to reduce our funds that we have available. Um, keep in mind, remember when the corrugated metal piping started to go bad and we needed money to fix stuff like yesterday because sinkholes were starting to form and that type of stuff. That's when those reserves are sincerely needed and thank God we have the ability to, to go to it. Um, getting down to 15% scares the hell out of me, but if that's where it's going to be, I'd rather see the old, any overage that we have being used to reduce our unfunded uh, pension deficits because that's what we're paying interest on top of interest on that basically. And that never makes economic sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And trying to get that more in control is is one of the best long term financial decisions. It, it's not the it's not the fun stuff, it's not the sexy stuff, it's not the thing we can go Hey, we we put that new road in, or we, but it is what will ensure that the city of Santee is still the city of Santee 30 years from now, uh, rather than watching that deficit get larger and wondering even further how we're going to uh, fund this. So I've said enough. Thanks. Before before you go on, um, have you heard anything on the uh, discount rate uh, being changed to four percent? Uh, no, I haven't. Where's the daylight's out of me? Uh, um, you know, after we've had some discussion, maybe we circle back around and you can explain why that is such a scary thing. Because when I was up in Sacramento last week, there was some discussion about that. And if that happens... Uh, well, when it was eight? <laughs> yeah, well, um, so let's circle back around after we've uh, talked. And so Good Lord. Is, if that goes there, then we got other problems. Okay. Um, right. Most of the cities in California they did that. Well, I, I, <coughs> um, see, sounds like lots of possibilities from Sacramento from coming down here, but I guess we got to deal with what we see before us. So, can we go back to uh, the general fund projection status quo scenario? That slide. So that, that's our uh, so that's our best scenario compared to the uh, recession scenario, obviously, right? So um, so we're looking at so what I see there's revenues of 46, uh, 46 million dollars, okay. right? Expenditures so uh, forty four, and uh, so it looks like we actually are a little bit over this year. So out of the uh, each of these fiscal years. We're, we're already actually overspending in four out of the five years, it looks like, just based on your projections. When you roll on the capital improvement program, the fully you, fund, what we've identified for the general fund. But we've done this, and so that's, so that's what's happening. And um, how many, so it even, so we're gonna get to that 15% red reserve threshold relatively quickly anyway, regardless of whether Sacramento changes that. Have you done any projections further out beyond um, fiscal year 23, 24 to, to see when that um, reserve begins to uh, diminish more greatly? Or does it accelerate? We're looking at, so it goes from 25 to 23, and then three, it looks like it, it's going down by upwards of 3% per year, maybe, starting in um, fiscal year 21, 22. So, um, so we're looking at six, six cycles to be to zero, maybe, if, if 
if it went down by three each time? Well, of course, we wouldn't bring four or five to some of our we'd make the changes. So for the status quo scenario, it takes us to zero in 2030? Based on these numbers with no other changes on the expenditure side. So if we do nothing, if we do nothing and just keep doing what we're doing, then we get to zero in, in 2030. And then, so what's the, uh, so what's the consequence of being at below 15 or below 20? So we're below, because 20 is mandated, or 15 maybe soon. No, the 20 percent is the city council's adopted reserve policy. It's not a statewide requirement, but it's, it's a prudent place to be. I mean, the consequence is when you get to the scenario, that's to me the consequence. If your burn reserves down below the 15 percent, your your ability to weather the storm. When the Great Recession hit, we had to do some major slashing of the budget. Revenues dropped dramatically, um, but we took a piece of the reserves and we used that. We had a planned use of reserves over a number of years to get us through to the end point. So, um, if you get the reserves below a certain point, hit the number 20, 15, whatever that number is, you put less less than your ability to weather. This storm. What's the what's the state mandate for reserves? Yeah, there is not one. There isn't one. No. Okay. Not currently. So so with status quo, we could we could potentially last through 20, 30. So um, we're looking at so Lemon Grove was looking at issues with the uh, potential of disincorporation, and so now they're looking at billboards. Um, they're probably doing everything that they can at this point now. Bake sales even. Bake sales. Well, I hope that's not our our big decision that we make today. So, but um, when so when does that scenario of disincorporation start to occur? How does that occur? If if we didn't do anything, how does where do you get there? Does that is that when the reserves at zero, or is that when we just say, oh, we're you know, or we're just bankrupt? How how does this? Work? I, mean, I can't answer the question because okay. I don't think we ever get. I'm not. I know, but what's what's at risk? City council or staff would ever let us get there. Okay. Well, or, or changes you have to make based make on the changes the, you have to make. What you're faced with. Okay. So. So. Um, as far as operating expenses or expenditures, so we're we're looking at that growing at about so about eight million dollars in in expenditures, but we're not we're going to be outpaced in our uh, from our our revenues. With um, I would say so with there's some efficiencies that could possibly occur within the operating expenditures. And, and we've already tried to maximize on that, right? So that's so that's like our cost. Like, so in the uh, so like say a scenario like uh, when we were looking at forming a CCA or something of that nature, and say we had uh, say we had gone in that direction, potentially our electricity bill would be in our operating expenditures. Correct. What's our electricity bill? Six hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand. What about our um, fuel budget? What is, it, it's in operating expenditures? Okay. Well, I'd love to know exactly what those are for um, future, because I, I think that um, there might be um, an opportunity for efficiency there. Because um, I think there's probably uh, maybe maybe somewhere between um, three quarters to a million dollars um, worth of um, um, savings that could have occurred had we gone forward with the CCA or something of that nature, potentially. So I think that we should continue to look at, um, and maybe that's just one example, one possibility in looking at operating, um, you know, operating expenditures and trying to, you know, have um, be the most efficient and the most lean organization that we can be, and um, look at look at the uh, financial implications of that because uh, I know now that October is, has passed, but there's there's definitely another opportunity, and, and maybe had we had this information about these. Uh, Potentially catastrophic financial scenarios. Maybe we could have acted um, in a more prudent uh, manner, or maybe not. So, but let's look at the recession scenario. So it looks like the recession scenario has us um, dropping at a much quicker rate. Uh, potentially uh, between this year 21, 22, upwards of uh, seven percent per year. So, so maybe that'd be a, so the acceleration of the. Uh, of the use of the reserve would be doubled in a, in this mild recession scenario, which is which is, which is likely um, because we've had um, such a long period of economic growth. So potentially, we could be in uh, economic um, uh, boiling water even quicker than 2030. 
I want to um, look at some historical data. And I want to um, actually, um, I just want to say, and I want to compliment you, Tim, because you actually nailed all your numbers so well, because I actually figured I'd just keep the numbers in front of me. But um, you were able to um, put forth uh, most of the uh, numbers, unless you have them on your screen before you now. So, um, let me get a quick drink here. So, um, if what I'm seeing here, so for over the last, uh, this is like a 10 year um, statistics here you have. So, in property taxes, we, um, we brought in $18.9 million. Is that correct? $18.9 million in 2019. And uh, sales tax revenue, we bought in uh, 14, 14.1? 14 correct. About 14. So, um, so they're, they're comparable to each other. Um, let's see here. So real property transfer tax. Could you give me a little bit of information on what that is? Sure. Every time a uh, piece of property is sold, there is a tax that's shared 50-50 between the county and the city. It's uh, like 0. 0.0055 of a percent. So it doesn't bring in a whole lot, though. No, it's not. And then our special assessments, we've, we've already kind of went over what those are. So they're used for special, so just, specific purposes. So just under $2 million dollars there. So that's, you know, that's small potatoes. Franchise fees, we're looking at three. Uh, TOT, a half mil. Mm -hmm. And then the gas tax, you know, it looks like it unfortunately only gave us about 600000 of the million dollars we might have been hoping for. It looks like we were at 1.5, and then you, for uh, 2019, you got 2.1. Does that sound about right? 2.1. 2.1. So um, what I think is interesting is, um, so looking at it in 2010, our sales tax revenue was about $7 million. And so um, between uh, 2010 and then coming up to 2019, uh, we've, we doubled. We actually doubled our, uh, our sales tax revenues. So I'd say a spectacular. But, I mean, you know, there's been growth there and, and um, done quite well. Um, quite the opposite of what um, I heard in some previous comments about sales taxes. But um, yeah, and in fact, um, it looks like um, the part of one of the, the greatest um, accelerant was between 2018 and 2019. So it looks like uh, we were up by um, $1.4 million. So that, that must have been a, a nice windfall for you to have seen. So what I also find interesting is our uh, property taxes. So I, I, I thought that those would have went in a different direction, but it looks like our property taxes were uh, almost $23 million in 2010, and now in 2019, they're uh, 18.9. So, so what's the accounting for that? So, yeah, the anomaly is redevelopment. The last one. redevelopment yeah. money. So, um, so a massive drop from 2011 to 2012. And then we've been... Dissolved January 2012. Yes. So, but it doesn't... I think uh, we, we've had, uh, we've done, we've grown there as well. And, uh, and it seems to me that, um, we have, yeah, so we, we've uh, definitely have, um, we've maximized um, a lot of the property tax. Now, as far as, um, so what are property, what property taxes? So I think that's interesting too. So what, what, what are the property taxes? So we're looking at, um, so residential, we're looking at almost $5 million potentially in residential um, property taxes came in in 2019. But when I look at commercial, we only had about six $650,000 is that what it is? This is in this is in thousands, but is, is this in millions or is it's like it's definitely not billions? But I think it's mislabeled here. Yeah, property tax or is it the valuation numbers? Oh, the valuation. So that's the assessed value. So it's the so the value is in billions. Okay. Right. Yeah, so uh, so in commercial, so it seems like in we, so we have a, a huge amount of value in property taxes coming for residential, but in commercial and industrial, we, it just seems like um, we haven't grown nearly as much. Seventy percent residential. We're over seventy percent um, residential. Yeah. So, it, you know, when I when I look at those, you know, when I'm looking at that, it, it seems to me that I, I think that um, the commercial and industrial side definitely um, is where we need to be focusing. Um, I I appreciate um, uh, the comments um, coming in about um, from the audience about sprawl growth. We we, we do need to grow. Um, however. Um, it's my understanding that for every dollar that is put into development, it costs about a um, dollar ten to a dollar um, forty for uh, a city to manage that debt and to uh, maintain that infrastructure. So, although 
growth is good and, and we want to grow, I think, uh, I think that we, we do have to have, to, um, have concerns about kind of kicking the can down the road um, with that sort of development. So I, I do appreciate those comments. Um, I think that if um, through residential growth, if that's all we needed, we, would, we, wouldn't be in this, we wouldn't be having this problem now. So I think we need to, to diversify um, what we're doing. And so um, that's why I think I'm looking at the commercial and industrial. Um, specifically, I think the uh, prospect corridor is, um, it just looks like a big storage area for steel. So I think, um, there's um, opportunity uh, there. Now, um, going back to the uh, this recession scenario, so which which areas of um, where where's our our greatest vulnerabilities if we were to look at um, so versus um, our property tax versus our sales tax or whatnot, all all together or where, where do we take the biggest hits? Well, I think sales tax we're, we're more exposed. We've talked about some of those dynamics, you know, with the changes in the, in the retail market, online sales. Uh, the way retail is done, buying habits, buying habits, mm -hmm. there's a whole you know, demographic type change <coughs> that's occurring. So, um, so if there's a recession, the, uh, the the area that has is at the most risk is the sales tax. I think so. so that's where we would have sure. we would lose our most money and, and have our greatest. Uh, yes. Like in 2010 and 11 and right. 12, yes. the number was way low. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Okay. So um, so it seems like also. Knowing that, then I, that might be my biggest concern of where we have our biggest vulnerability because we don't, we can't. If there's a recession now, we we don't have any control over that. That's just the way the market is. So, so I think um, that's just something that um, should definitely be under consideration. Now let's see here. TOT. So we're looking at um, so there's a, so a half a half million dollars is coming in in TOT. Um, if we if we added another hotel, we're looking at potentially increasing that by another two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. So uh, maybe so that that helps also somewhat, you know, with um, the potential savings in our uh, our fossil fuel and, and electrical bill. I don't think uh, franchise uh, franchise fees are going to well that's going to increase slightly, right? With um, so what is that? It's going to go down. Net par almost. You're going to lose on we're going to lose on Cox, but we're going to yeah. probably gain on. So we're not going to go anywhere with franchises. It's so tiny that it's not a big area because of the loss of. And it's so small. It's so small. Well, I think the uh, the business as usual um, status quo is going to hurt us badly. I think we need to look to um, definitely have to look to efficiencies. We have to look to um, things like um, creation of the CCA. I think we need to uh, focus on um, commercial and industrial um, development. I think uh, as well as residential, but as far as that, I think um, we need to look at um, the potential for um, focusing on infill versus sprawl. Um, I think that um, that'll give us a uh, smaller footprint of infrastructure that we have to maintain over time. And I think that is important I don't. I don't want us to uh, be increasing um, our debt load for the future, because likely what's happening here is we're we're dealing with the uh, uh, the uh, credit card of uh, the from our past. Everybody else, everybody who's ever worked here, everybody's um, unfunded pensions and everything that's come to the city before us. Um, but as far as um, before disincorporation, I would I would be open to. Um, doing whatever it takes to keep Santee from being disincorporated. And I would not allow, just like you said, although I think that um, status quo could lead us that way. And um, at this time, I don't think that, um, aside from a CCA, I think that's about, um, and efficiencies, that's probably about as far as it's going to go with this council. So thank you. Uh, thanks. I, I want to make one thing clear, though, if I can. I don't think we've ever <coughs> talked about this incorporating here or going bankrupt. So, I mean, is my recollection correct on that? Okay, thank you. Well, I think this is the time to be talking about it just because yeah. we need to look at the economic reality. And, and also, um, you know, I would have some concern of, um, of our staff, um, you know, seeing that economic reality if, if we don't act and if we don't look at that. Um, we could um, lose um, people who are excellent and have been extremely efficient over time. 
And so it, it is an economic reality. And um, unfortunately, 2030 is only 10 years away. And, and so time, um, it could travel very quickly. Um, you know, it's, only, it's only a few election cycles away. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that the way I'm looking at this is, is I, I'm seeing a lot of tax information here about doing a tax increase. And I just want to remind everybody, uh, MTS is planning a half cent sales tax on this ballot. Um, and Sandag's planning a, in 2022, I think it is, planning a half cent sales tax on theirs. And there's everybody, the, the answer seems to be, let's throw a sales tax increase on everything. And it, it's just not, it, sooner or later people are going to get tired of this. I was surprised Chula Vista passed theirs, frankly, and a couple of these others passed it. But I don't think that's the answer right now. I think if, you know, if we finally get into the answer of uh, where we are in the Lemon Grove situation, then yeah, maybe we need to look at it. But right now it's like, we need to get ambitious and, um, you know, maybe go after more sales tax increases and maybe get that auto dealership that we keep talking about, maybe getting that extra hotel we keep talking about, maybe getting a, the theater finally in here, which is more than some good restaurants and, you know, make this the place to be. That's what we're trying to do right now. And I think we just need to keep working the way we are. Um, yes, there's a lot of money coming out. Yes, there's a lot of money going, you know, but that doesn't mean we have, we can't change our budget. Um, Stephen did have a good point about the, uh, you know, if we have to do the CCA, and I'm not saying we don't want to, but we just don't want to do it on the city of San Diego's dime. That's our problem with it. Uh, and then we also don't want to do, uh, do it on the, a bunch of liberal cities on the coast. So we're going to make sure that when we do this, we do it where we're not uh, losing it in the long run. So we, so, and, and if we can do solar and cut the costs <coughs> here in the county, that's fine, in the city, that's fine. Let's do those things. So I don't disagree with what he's saying there. I, I agree with what the mayor is, but you know we don't. Let's let's keep working on what we have and keep working on what we can do, and maybe try and get a little more ambitious on trying to get some of these. Uh, maybe an auto dealership in, and maybe you know we were talking about going to Las Vegas to really try and push these people to get in here. You know, if we have to go up to Stater Brothers and say, "Hey, Stater Brothers, come on down. Let's do it." If we have, let's start. Let's start getting aggressive rather than let me send an email and let me do this and let me do this and nobody does anything. All we get is an email reply back. Thanks for thanks for your email. Sometimes we don't even do that. So I think we need to really start working on trying to get some big businesses in here that people want to come to. They want to come to Santee already. Where the you know I, my my motto was Santee is where East County shops because people are coming down from Tampa. They're coming from Alpine. Let's get some businesses here where they want to hang out here. I want El Cajon is really moving business right now. They're giving the giving it away, but let's uh, let's make sure they do it. You know they've got car dealerships coming in, they've got really nice restaurants coming in. How do they get them? What are they doing that we're not? Why are they going to El Cajon and not Santee? Uh, and so let's work on that that a little bit more, and let's work on you know maybe trying to work on some of these budget issues. Uh, you know, maybe we just have to cut back on some of these CIP programs. Maybe we have to do some of this stuff, but, you know, I don't see it being that, you know, short of the recessionary one, um, I don't see it really being that bad right now that we can't control it, we can't work on it with a low aggression. So let's just, everybody else has said their version, so it's fine. I, I do want to clarify one thing. Um, if we go to Las Vegas, it's uh, not to gamble. Um, we actually are going there for a purpose. Uh, we're uh, actually members of the International uh, Council of Shopping Centers. Um, having said that, uh, shopping centers are a wide variety of types of businesses, uh, not just uh, more restaurants, although they do, you know, push a lot of them there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've been very uh, assertive over the, the last uh, at least 20 years or, or a little bit longer. Uh, Pam, when, when did we start going to ICSC? Was it about 1998? That was it exactly. And then uh, we started exhibiting um, with a booth in 99. And yeah. had a booth right up till 2011. But that was when we launched. In 2010, the chamber joined with us.
And, and that was our first, um, I think it was 2011, the Chamber joined with us. And we actually brought in six or seven or eight people to go up there and, and walk, the, basically walk the streets because it's, it's, you know, thousand booths, I think. It's, yeah, it's five mile walk. Yeah, it's, it's pretty intensive. And quite frankly, that's, I, I hear people around the county ask, how is it you do so well on a lot of what we do? And it's because we do educate um, not just our um, staff, but our council on what some of the things mean when it comes to economic development and businesses. So, um, so that's, that's what uh, Ron's talking about. He says, well, let's go to Vegas and bring some business. And we're not going to bring gambling. Um, so I just, just wanted to clear that up in case somebody wondered what you were talking about. So, um, and, and um, you know, some of the things that we have to look at is that in uh, 2007, 8, 9, and 10, there was a huge downturn in the economy. Um, not only uh, one reason why we had a lower property tax increase is because the assessor started uh, reassessing property and giving discounts. And so um, once that uh, turned around, then uh, there were more homes coming and and uh, being sold and and even the ones that uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Rob, but some of the homes that were um, real estate owned that were turned over and they were reevaluated once again and, and then we got a higher property tax on them. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why uh, I think property and sales tax has doubled over the years. Uh, but what we have to do is continue to find uh, a way to uh, make sure that they continue to grow. I think with the Wayfair decisions, things like that, you kind of mentioned that they are going to continue to grow for us. We just don't uh, know what that uh, is going to look like for sure. Um, maybe what we could do is look for more online businesses to bring here, warehousing even, uh, where they uh, sell from. And uh, so, so I don't want anybody to think that, um, that we're going to do things in a status quo fashion. Uh, we're going to continue to think out of the box. We're going to go after business, industry, or whatever it takes. And uh, we're going to partner with those that can help us to get there. And so, um, but uh, we are um, continuing to have unfunded mandates by the state of California. And uh, the state of California doesn't increase their tax. And the reason why they don't increase their tax is because they don't want anybody to think they're the bad guy. But what they do is they go and they uh, continue to take money from counties and cities and special districts so that they have no choice but to raise the ta city taxes, raise their um, franchise fees, and raise whatever other uh, means they have uh, with their membership or clients to get money. So it puts it on us to be the bad guy. And so it's our job to uh, fend that off as long as we possibly can. And uh, I think that um, we're doing a good job of that. Um, we're going to continue to raise our uh, revenues. We're not going to remain status quo, so I don't think I'm worried about uh, what it's going to look like as far as bankruptcy in 10 years, because we will have an answer way before that. Uh, but we just can't sit there and not do anything. Otherwise, we will be in that situation. So, um, but before, before I have uh, Marlene uh, kind of wrap things up for us, um, can you tell us about this discount rate and what all that means? Because so many people don't understand that, you know, uh, and Rob mentioned, oh, it was 8% at one time. And then, but it seems like even though it gets lower and lower, we still pay more and more. So, um, so that we need to have a little bit better understanding of that. The discount rate is the assumed rate of return on the retirement plan assets. And the recent dynamic that's playing out that's responsible directly for the annual four to five hundred thousand dollar increases each and every year, one on top of the other in our retirement costs, is the reduction in the discount rate or the assumed rate of return on the retirement plan assets only from seven point five percent down to seven point zero percent. Just going from 7.5 to 7.0 is adding the, the magnitude that I just described. There, I've heard the talk initially of 
six to five or maybe six percent. I haven't heard of the four percent. Even the six point two five makes me more than nervous. Yeah. I mean, if, if it needs to be, it needs to be. If it's based on a true long period of time, actual experience, and, and looking forward at you know what the expected rate of returns, then then of course you have to you have to make corrections somehow, some way. So if I understand this right, the, the discount rate or the expected rate of return is, let's say, in easy numbers. Let's say it's, they expected to make $10 million in um, their investments. And they only made $750,000, um, then we have to come up with the other 200, I mean, uh, yes, $7 million. So because they didn't, do their numbers right because they didn't make as much as they wanted to. To CalPERS credit, I mean, a lot of what we've been squeezed with over the last five to ten years has been them tweaking the actuarial assumptions. They're getting it better over time. Unfortunately, they got it wrong for too many years on the front end of that, and now <coughs> we're paying the price to try to get it back on track. So they've shortened the amortization periods, which means if you have the year where there's a huge disparity between the assumed return of revenue and what actually comes in. Instead of kicking the can 30 years down the road, it only gets kicked 20 years down the road. Um, I mean that's, that's to the benefit of the retirement system. There's no practical way that you could, in one year, have to make up if there's a shortfall in one year that, hey guys, pay it, pay it all the following year. Cities couldn't do that. They can't plan, they don't have the resources. So squeezing the amortization period from 30 years to 20 years is a tool that CalPERS has properly implemented. It's the right thing to do. It's just one more pressure point on the system. Okay, that, that helps a little bit there. Thank you. I know there's a lot of people probably watching and goes, what are you talking about? But, but this is important to understand is that we're making up for their deficit. And uh, the fact is they don't always... Uh, use a very good um, practices to uh, make their, um, well, make their investments. So, anyways, Arlene. Okay, um, council members, the point in today's discussion is a workshop scenario. We wanted to present to you a variety of ideas. And yes, there's a lot of information about taxes in the presentation because Many communities in California either have them or they're looking at them. Imperial Beach just hired a consultant to go look to see, you know, would their community be interested in it. We know Lone Grove has one that's in process by a citizen's initiative. Um, we understand from previous discussions with council that that's not uh, necessarily a high priority with you, but there are citizens in the community who want to understand the difference between those scenarios. So that's why we wanted to make sure to, to get that out there because it is a source of revenue um, that is a possibility. At the same time, um, what we hear the council saying today, uh, and I want to speak to a couple of points that were brought up, the CCA uh, is not a, an if and when. Um, that is a requirement based upon the Climate Action Plan, the Santee, Sustainable Santee Plan that was just adopted. The city will be looking at a CCA. There are a lot of other expenses that go along with the Climate Action Plan, but the CCA is an opportunity um, Kathy Valverde has been working on that. We are still in discussions with the county. Uh, and the goal at this point is to bring this city council back a CCA that can be implemented at the end of 2020 that will go into um, the one year of the implementation plan review with the state so we can actually see that in 2022. That's our goal. Um, I can also tell you that both, if I understand correctly, Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, but both of the CCAs the city had an opportunity to join have been delayed. They are not being implemented in 2021 because SDG&E cannot provide the appropriate billing cycles for them to make that happen. So while we did not implement as soon as many in our community wanted to, uh, there's, not a, there's not a delay for us because even if we get it going in this current year, which is the plan, hopefully we'll be able to be on the same timeline and, and implement it uh, along with the other communities at the same timeline. So, uh, so there are some benefits to that. There are some opportunities um, in looking at solar projects, electricity, um, fuel costs are things that we'll be looking for. There's a requirement to look at electric vehicles for the city fleet. So 
the scenarios that you see don't include all of those options because we just don't know how to, to put, plug those in yet. And many of them may take a little longer than a five-year timeline to be able to implement. But those are things that the city staff are going to be looking at going forward. Uh, there was a question about uh, residential versus commercial. Um, in most of California, as the community and council know, there's a big push to build additional housing. Um, we've been dealing with that just like other communities. Um, housing traditionally does not pay for itself. That is true. Um, even if you factor in some of the other benefits that go along with the, the construction there. But that is also why the city did what it did with the Weston project and we implemented what's called the Community Facilities District that helps offset the differential between what the property tax and estimated sales tax and other revenues that would benefit the city um, differentiate between the cost of providing services to those communities. So that's all in the negotiations with new development on a large enough project. You can't implement a CFD on small projects with three to four units, eight to 16 units, even up to a couple hundred units. There's not enough critical mass there to implement a CFD, and that's where you have problems. It's easier to implement a CFD on a larger project. Um, discussions of sprawl aside, it's easier to implement a CFD on a larger project where there's actually a critical mass enough that can spread those costs and be able to fund them. So regardless of the politics in that discussion, we just want to get that detail out there for everybody. Right. So neither one or the other may be this council's preference, but in order to offset the cost of residential, it's easier to do on a larger project with a CFD or some other sort of financing tool. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is, yes, the city do, did do a lot with ICSC in past years. Recall that that was all funded by redevelopment. Um, we don't have that tool anymore. That's gone. Um, there was a lot of discussion regarding economic development, and the city does want to do that. We did implement the Arts and Entertainment District, which allows for us to focus on things that can't be done online, things that you have to come to to enjoy, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a, a miniature golf. I mean, you know, it's really difficult to do those kinds of things online. So we're trying to focus on the types of land uses that require people to be here. And, and we think that's a positive step that we have taken. There was some discussion about a grocery store in Stater Brothers. I, we, Pam and I know, Stater Brothers has looked at Santee. We don't get to control and force them to come. They have looked at various elements of the community and they've said there's not enough infrastructure in place. Some of the buildings around the vacant parcels are old and crummy looking, so to speak, in their opinion. And uh, so we don't want to go there. We don't get to control our economic development future. We have to focus on that, but we don't get to control that. Um, auto dealers, I can tell you there's been at least one, if not two, that have looked at Santee. We don't have anybody who wants to sell the land to there make a deal for an auto dealer to come here. Um, the city also doesn't get to control that. We need a private party to be willing to sell their property and make a private deal. Nor am I suggesting that we want to get in the middle of that. We'd rather have the private sector handle those deals, but there are restrictions on how we can help make that happen. Um, El Cajon, pardon me, El Cajon is growing. El Cajon, I can tell you, has been able to implement and, and facilitate 90% of their building permits by mid-year. I was just at a meeting with a presentation by El Cajon staff. We hear a lot about traffic in Santee and please don't grow. We hear a lot about various areas of the neighborhood we don't want people to grow in because there's, it's difficult. And staff understands it. I know council understands that. But a lot of the impacts we're getting are from people outside of the city limits of Santee that are growing. When El Cajon has 90% of its building permits issued by December, they're planning on a lot more building. That building is what encourages economic development. When they see high growth numbers in the community, retailers say, maybe I want to go there. As most of this community knows, Parkway Plaza is sort of a, an old dead shopping center, and I would rather come shop in Santee any day of the week than go to Parkway Plaza. However, with the closure of Sears, you'll know if you go to Parkway Plaza, the city of El Cajon has been entertaining home improvement and home um, amenities. 
we've got Ashley Furniture. They focused all of those to go in the old Sears store. Why? Because for retailers to come, it's easier to go in a vacant building than it is for them to build a new building. So you need empty buildings for retailers to look at. That encourages them to want to go there. So for the city of Santee to focus on that, we need to look at how do we reuse some of our vacant spots. We don't have a lot of them, and most of them are smaller locations. That doesn't mean staff should look at that or focus, and we hear council saying we want to do more of that. So we will continue to do that. But just to just to interrupt, you you know, this thing shows those items. It does. And so and, and when you're saying, well, we going, can't get those right items, now we're going, we shouldn't have put it in there. It, well, but that's some of the things that we want to make sure council understands. And, and the community understands as well. We need to be able to focus on some of those things, but they're not always easy. We need to be able to try uh, some new tactics. And the other side of that is, I'm sorry, Father, but some people think that you put in a auto dealership and that's a million dollars a year to the city. They, Correct. Having realistic numbers is what we need, what everybody needs to see. Uh, the other side of that is, speaking of El Cajon, the way that they're getting some of these businesses in are by giving away the tax revenue that they get, which means there is no, there's no net benefit to the, the city of El Cajon to take care of their obligations. We need well, we're talking 20 years down the line. So we, we need to be smart about that and and partner with businesses, but not give away the farm just to say we we built something. And uh, it, it'd be great to expand our, our business side, but as you stated, the reality is businesses have to want to come here. There have to be people for them to want to come here. And there has to be land for them to be able to build on and do what they need. The city of Santee does not own land. We, it's not owned by Santee. We don't have any control over it. It's owned by private citizens, corporations, and the county. If they can't make deals, we have no say-so. All we have the ability to do is state whether or not the business is permissible or if it's in the correct zoning. We don't have the ability to state that you must bring... Uh, oh God, we're the one we hear all the time now. Uh, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's, thank you. you. I can't tell you how many letters I got. You must bring Trader Joe's into Santee. I elected you, you bring in Trader Joe's. I'm like, wow, if I had that ability, we'd have had a Trader Joe's and Bath Pro and Cabela's and all that stuff a long time ago. It's not the reality. You don't we, have magic uh, Unfortunately, I don't. And then talking about prospects, that's, once again, it's all great and dandy, but that's all private land. We can't force somebody to give up the land that they've had for generations sometimes if they don't want to sell. I, I would agree with you, Council Member. There are things that we can look at to try to help that, like the Arts and Entertainment District, putting other sorts of overlays, making things easy, but we can't, in the end, we don't have final say so or control over those issues. Um, it's my job to give the good, bad, and the ugly, and, and one of the things I do want to remind the Council about is, I know, it's my dog, hate the messenger, but uh, here we go. Um, there are a number of facilities that this community has asked and, and they, have, they have begged for for a long, long time. Um, and, and part of this presentation is to allow people to understand why we don't have some of those things. El Cajon had a special tax that they put in that built their new police center and their animal shelter. Uh, it expired, it's done, but they still have a, a, a separate general sales tax in place. And that is assisting them when they get these other businesses coming in, they're getting a little bit more out of each one of those retailers than we currently would get. So that is just a, a, a fact of the matter as things sit right now. One of the other things that we need you to understand is that just in the last 48 hours, effectively, um, I had a conversation with the San Diego Sheriff's Department. Um, the public safety center that the city has talked about along Magnolia um, with the Sheriff's Department and our fire department, uh, a lot of people told me three years ago, well, that will never happen, it's not going to happen, it's number 20 or 25 on their list of infrastructure. That project has been moved up, we told you uh, during your workshop last March, it would be moved up to position number three. Right now, they're looking to buy the land for that center in next year's fiscal budget for the county. 
they have to buy it from themselves, which is interesting because they already own it, but one department needs the money, so they buy it from them, so they trade the money back and forth. Shall regardless, we? yes. But regardless, that transaction is going to occur in 2021. 20, and the animal control unit of the County of San Diego, who we are no longer contracted with, we probably have the Humane Society for Service, but the animal control unit is looking at trying to build an animal shelter in cooperation with the sheriff's department. Staff said, we wait, we, you know, I don't get to tell you whether you get to do that or not, but we want our public safety center with a replacement for fire station four. We want that on that site and the sheriff's department wants it on that site. We are in conversation to try to make that happen and it's been moved up significantly because the animal control center, the animal shelter, animal care center, needs to move immediately. They want to move that forward. In order for the city to be at the table, we have $75,000 that's budgeted for studies and analysis. But if you look at, in order for us to make that happen and be at the table fully, even if we built it out and we debt serviced it over 30 years, you're looking at $1.1 million. If I look at these numbers, that's four auto dealers. And we're going to need them within yeah, three years, four years. Um, those are the realities. To stay where we are, to help build that before the debt service, uh, to get us the new fire station, and, and move these forward. So while that message is perhaps not what the community wanted to hear, probably not what council wants to hear, that's part of my job, is to balance out those messages and those details. We have an opportunity on that center, but we need to look at a way to raise the money for that debt service. And, and obviously, staff is going to negotiate that out to say, hey, we, maybe we can push off payment for it for a few years, partner with the county and take pay a little less at the beginning, pay a little more later. We are going to do whatever we can to make things work. The, the doom and gloom doesn't have to be absolute. That's not the point here. But this is a workshop, and we want to let the community know we're trying to look at all avenues that are available to us. And, and an emphasis on economic development is something that we do need to do. We have opportunities we're looking at for a hotel, for a theater complex. The theater won't bring us a lot, but there's a restaurant there, so we'll get something. I'll get a little property tax off of that. But again, if you look at the value, there's a $20 million commercial building. That's about what the theater's going to be. There's about $40,000. You know, if we want to help with the public safety center, we need $1.1 $40,000 is not, it's not going to cut a chink in that. So we just want council and the community to understand those are the kinds of things that behind the scenes, the city council and staff are really working, trying to balance out. And we want to make that happen. But it may or may not be able to happen solely off of economic development by itself. Um, we're going to be as creative as we can. We're going to do what we can. Um, we don't get to control economic development, but I think we're doing a pretty good job of trying to balance out the issues. Uh, the mayor is well aware that East County has a really difficult time in bringing in industrial growth. Um, the buildings here in East County are older. They're not the right size for some of the new types of industry. They don't have some of the infrastructure that new industry wants. So we have to work with our building community, our business community, on modifying those buildings, trying to bring them up to par with what we can be competitive with. But the question is, who's going to pay for the cost to make that happen? And that's difficult not only for Santee, but also for El Cajon, La Mesa, and a lot of the unincorporated area where you see some of the industrial pockets. Uh, we, we have a more difficult time because we don't have ready access to capital to make that happen. Life happens on the coast. It's just a reality. Doesn't mean we're not going to work on that, but those are the kinds of things that we deal with. Um, when it comes to billboards, I know that the city had a proposal years ago to look at a billboard and that was not thought of as, as an option for us. Um, I can't comment on Lemon Groves because I know they're going down a different road than maybe we might want to do, but the city has an opportunity to put in a small billboard that is unique that goes with our brand, not, not the over the freeway signage, okay, that, that was presented in the brand workshop. I don't think that's what really happened. That's not what we all want. But an opportunity to put up something on the freeway that advertises Santee and some of the businesses here. Small, 
you know, more aesthetically pleasing than, here, we're a giant auto mall, please come to visit us. That, that's not what anybody really wants, I don't think. But if we're thinking of ourselves as a business, and what we understand from Sanday and their studies are that approximately 70 to 75% of the traffic on Highway 52 is not coming to Santee, is not going from Santee, has nothing to do with Santee. If I'm a business and I'm trying to operate the city as a business, I'm saying that's a ready market to get customers to come to Santee, to help us improve our sales tax, to find out there's pads here to build, to find out there's options. <coughs> so that will be something that we hope to look at in the future. Will it improve us from a financial viewpoint? I'm not exactly sure. We don't have a deal on the table like Lone Road does. But I would tell you that that is something that, from a staff perspective, we think might be something that could be an option for us to help advertise our businesses and pull some of that traffic that, let's face it, is sitting trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do today because I have half an hour to wait on 52. Let's give them something to look at. Let's give them something to think about. Maybe I should come back and hit a movie up in Santee. Maybe I should come back and hit dinner up here. Maybe I should get my kids off and go sign them up for a program at Sportplex, whatever that might be. Uh, but let's use that signage opportunity to give them a chance to know more about our community and be a part of us. And that can help our economic development efforts. Um, I think those were the major points that we heard from Council today. Uh, those are just some comments and responses we'll try to answer for you. Yes, while we are facing issues going forward, I think it would be hard to name another city other than maybe a couple of them in the state that aren't facing these issues. We're not alone. Um, and staff is going to do whatever we can to assist the council and make sure that Santee stays a place that people want to be in as much as we have revenue to support us. Uh, and we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. Um, but it's our job today to give you, as I said, the good, the bad, the ugly, and to hopefully open some eyes to think about other alternatives based on timing of when revenues could be available and when we want to see revenues here. It was interesting. Uh being out at the Olympic pre-trial this uh, weekend. I was there for nearly 12 hours. And I can tell you, our staff, some of them were there a lot longer than that. So thank you very much for being there. Um, I talked to probably more people on Saturday than I had in a long time. And there were a lot of people that came down from uh, their homes in Santee, believe it or not. And many of them said, I don't, didn't know this was going on. Unfortunately, the, the uh, promoters didn't promote very well, but they were very surprised. Um, but we talked about other things going on in Santee, like the Mass Park opening. Uh, there's a lot of people that want Mass Park to open because they like to go there, people that don't even live in Santee. I also talked to a lot of people that were not from Santee, that came for that pre-Olympic trial. And, and what happened is that these people came to our communities, they spent their money, and so those are the things that uh, help us to generate extra sales tax also. Uh, Bill, your, um, you know, your department does a wonderful job at um, promoting our city. Um, Bree's not here, but she's... Uh, undertaking some of the uh, marketing also now in the city. She has a, a real gift of, uh, you know, having worked in your department for a long time. And we continue to expect to see that. I mean, not because I'm telling you, you better do it or you're going to be out of here, but because I know that it's just inherent to what you and your staff do for us. So, um, so the more... The more we do like that, and I can tell you right now, people come here because, like for instance, they can come to our concerts for free. Well, they're not really free, but we do have great sponsors. And, and those are the people that uh, want to do business in our community also. And the more that uh, businesses out there know about that kind of opportunity and come here, uh, maybe they'll, the bigger ones uh, will be able to convince some of the, you know, the aging out businesses that uh, it's time to sell your business, sell your property, and uh, that can be a great retirement system for you. Um, and that's probably one of the ways that we might be able to 
turn over property. Other than that, that Rob's right, you can't hold a gun to somebody's head and say, you know, sell us your property or give it up. Um, but I think we have great opportunity in the future. Um, our brand says that. As a matter of fact, I have heard a lot of comments about, wow, why isn't anybody else marketing the way you're marketing? And we've only done this for about a month. And uh, people love the idea of do more be least. And we um, probably will start convincing more businesses they need to do more be least. I don't necessarily want to suggest they go to El Cajon to do more, <laughs> or to Lakeside, or to El Cajon, or anywhere else. Uh, however, if they do, then it's going to help our entire region. Um, but Santee has a lot to offer, and uh, I think we're going to offer that. Uh, staff, do you have anything else that you want to add to that? I want to thank uh, Bill Bomering uh, and Alan Carlisle, who was here a little bit earlier from the Water District, for sitting in and hearing what we're talking about. Uh, do you have anything to add or okay. questions? Okay. Anyone else from the uh, community have any last-minute uh, questions? I, I have a question. Can you please go to the microphone? And then we'll have to get a speaker slip after you're done. I'll make it short so I don't pass out. So I hear a lot about uh, growth and, and um, business growth, and I think there's a big here I, go, let me pass. I think there's a big elephant in the room. In in the past couple of years, there's been a couple of large places that wanted to come to Santee, and they've had a, a huge, difficult time coming. And with nobody in this room, but how do we tell people to come in? To Santee, when they see what's happened to other people trying to come to Santee. That's one of the things I think we need to address. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Charles Strauss should have been here years ago. And they planned a, a much larger project back then, from the information I have. And it was so hard for them to come to town. Um, there's another project that's been going around social media that would bring a new hotel, an updated, cool place. And everybody's boo booing on that. And so I'm just wondering, we're talking here to bring people here. And then on the other side, people have a massive, you know, hill to climb to bring anything here. So I wanted to mention that in a public forum because it's ridiculous. I, I come to all the meetings, I watch this, and we're here trying to get more money. But yet, any time any large thing wants to come to town, they get put through the ringer. And I don't think those two things, you know, Go together. So I just wanted to say that a lot. Great. Thanks. It, well, oh, yeah. Um, Rob wants me to make sure that uh, everyone understands it's not the council that's the uh, impediment here. Um, and uh, although there are, um, everybody does have a, a legal right to, um, you know, bring concerns forward in a, uh, in a um, legal way, we'll say. And um, we just have to deal with that. We have to find a way to deal with that. And if nothing else, to find a way to expedite the concerns when it is brought forward. So that's a very good, um, very good point. So, all right then. If there's nothing else, uh, we'll stay in the journey. Or sit in the journey. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>